How's it going everybody? My name is Brandon Clements and welcome to this tutorial where we're going to be talking about linear workflow in Maya. And I've been wanting to do this tutorial for a long time and I had a question this weekend that involved linear workflow so I thought it was about time that I finally made this tutorial. So let's go ahead and jump in and see what we got. You can see in this scene I just have a simple shader uh, for this sphere. Um, it's sitting in a, in a very simple room. If I switch to the perspective view, you can see it's just elongated so that my camera can sit in here with the lens that I want. And uh, we just went ahead and extruded a place for the window and it's beveled a little bit. So super simple. We also have a wood texture on the floor. Um, so we're actually going to be looking at how linear workflow can improve our renders for our textures and our regular shaders that we have in our scene. So if I go ahead and bring this up and do a quick render, you can see um, that it renders nothing because there are no lights in our scene. So let's go ahead and jump into our render settings. And one thing that I want to do is just add our physical sun and sky. And so if I go ahead and click create, then we will automatically have final gathering turned on for us and we'll be able to render. So if we go to, I'm just holding the right mouse button to go to render, uh, render, and then we're going to do camera one and see what this looks like. So you can see we get a little bit of indirect illumination into our scene and uh, we don't have our light pointing into our scene necessarily. So we get a bunch of, uh, Bunch of bunch of our indirect illumination calculation showing up on the walls here, very splotchy like. Okay, so let's go ahead real quick and turn our light. I just hit the left bracket to reposition my camera since I did not jump successfully out into the perspective view, and I'll open up my outliner and then click on my. I can delete that point light. Um, I can actually scale this up a little bit and then point it in the direction into the window. Okay, so that should actually help. Now let's jump over and do another render. Okay, and this is the result that we get and I have been actually messing around with the scene a little bit today. Um, so you may have a little bit different of a result. So this is the render that I'm getting um, on my machine right now and you can see that everything in the scene um, is not actually coming through quite like we would expect. So let's go ahead and set up our linear workflow so that our colors and our textures and everything are, dif are displaying properly in our render. So I'll go over to my comments tab and I'll make sure that enable default light is uh, unchecked. I always do that for every scene. And then from there, I'm going to change my image format to OpenEXR so that we can go into our quality tab to RGBA float 4x32 bit. Um, what this means is there's red, green, blue, and alpha channel um, and 32 bits per channel um, so that when we go into our compositing package, we'll actually have all that color data built right into our file. So the next thing that I'm going to do is enable color management here in the commons tab and this is describing uh, this was a utility that was built in more recent versions of Maya I'm in 2014 right now uh, I believe it was implemented in 2011 of Maya but basically what it's saying is our default input profile our textures that are coming into our renderer are going to be sRGB textures and that's something that this workflow in particular is just assuming is that we are using 8-bit images, uh, PNGs, JPEGs, uh, TIFFs, things like that. Now, if it's a, um, a texture that is 32-bit, uh, that's something that we can describe in the actual file node. But for now, we're saying globally, we're expecting sRGB textures, and then it is actually going into the default output profile, which is what we are rendering in, uh, which is linear. So we're making sure that our color spaces and our textures are actually um, understood in this box here. The next thing that I want to do is make sure that in my um, my render view, by right clicking and going down to display, right click and hold, that I am in uh, that my render view is in 32-bit 
floating point HDR. Now, um, by default, it's 8-bit, but once you make this change, Maya is going to ask you to restart, and then once you restart, you can see that this will be invoked. So after that, I'm going to make sure that my color management tab is actually set to um, our color image profile is set to linear sRGB. Now you can see immediately I get a different look here in my render view. Uh, now what this is saying is we are rendering in a linear profile and we're actually going to be displaying an sRGB curve on our monitor. So this is more or less a LUT. Um, it's, it's hard to describe but you know we can load in LUT files, we can come in and actually uh, do Rec 709 for our display but I'm going to leave it at sRGB and after that, we should be good to go ahead and re-render our scene to check out our, our, our changes that we had made. So let's go ahead and go to render, render, and then camera one. So this is what my test scene is looking like now that I've increased the accuracy to 100 here. So 100 is pretty much overall the amount of rays that are being fired into your scene. And if I hover over... And once I select the render settings window and I hover over, you can see a uh, number of rays per final gather point cast into the hemisphere to estimate incandescent, in, or I'm sorry, incident global illumination. Higher values raise the accuracy of the result, which is expensive. Um, and so to actually get some faster render times, I'm going to show you a setting that I usually use. Um, I have this usually set to 10, um, and my point density I can have to 0.1, and then my point interpolation to something high like uh, 60. So my point density, if I hover over it, says the controls uh, controls the number of final gather points to be computed, performing the full and expensive fi final gather tracing. So um, I, for one, uh, especially for test results, uh, I don't usually leave it at one. I'll, I'll just go to a, a fraction of that, 0.1. And then my point interpolation, actually, this is a pretty cool uh, value here, but higher values smooth the final gather result at little cost. So uh, you can fire less rays into your scene and use the point interpolation to actually smooth out the results so you don't see some of these splotchiness on the walls. So I'll go ahead and save this for comparison and then re-render again. Okay, so after that render has finished, uh, we can compare our results. So this is what we are at right now and this is what we were at before. So you can see um, overall it has smoothed out. Um, there's not quite as much noise in the render, but we still have these very blotchy kind of hemispheres on our wall. And we're actually losing a little of the detail from the corners of the wall and the top and the bottom parts. And we'll go ahead and we can actually go in and uh, refine these results. Uh, right now, there's something else that we need to go ahead and address, and that is if I go ahead and select my camera that I'm rendering from and then go into the inputs and outputs, you can see that there is a node here. It's a uh, an exposure node that is hooked up to our camera automatically once we select the physical sun and sky settings. It automatically goes in and hooks that to our camera, and we actually have another uh, game of utility that is put onto our camera. So it's at 2.2 right now. Uh, which is not good for us because we already told Maya that we wanted to, in our color management rollout, we wanted the display color profile to be sRGB. So what this is saying is we need to have everything be rendering at the linear sRGB, and then we actually gamma correct that at the very end. Our monitor does that for us. So if we go ahead and select that node and change this to 1, we should be getting a better, more expected result. So I'll save this image and go ahead and re-render. Now this is actually closer to the color space that we need to be actually displaying and actually computing. Now there's one thing that is not correct, and that is the shader that we have on this sphere. And not that the shader is incorrect, but the color on our on our color uh, swatch right here for our diffuse color is um, not gamma corrected, and um, it, it is kind of a chore to do inside, but inside of Maya, but usually I'm actually having a texture or something else, and that is all managed from the color management. Uh, roll out right here. Simple shader right here. The one that I'm going to be applying has a ramp which is carrying that same red color that that is then um, put into the value slot of the gamma correct node and to actually connect that up you middle click drag and drop into the value and then you can see that our 
color looks much darker, but you'll see that once we apply this shader to the sphere and we compare the result, that we're getting something way more accurate than what we actually chose in our color rollout. So let's go ahead and hit render camera. So now if we compare the results from the red and the gamma correction and the red that's not gamma corrected, you can see there are just huge, huge differences between the two. And this red does not match any of the reds that we actually chose from the beginning. Um, you can see it's pretty pink, and here it is actually more red, um, considering that's what we chose. But as we go to the latest version, you see that this red, now gamma corrected, matches the first red that we chose. Uh, it's just too bad that our preview here shows something that is way darker, but don't be fooled. Um, this red that we chose for the ramp is the same red that we're getting in our render. It's just being gamma corrected and then displayed in our preview as a darker color, uh, which makes sense since the multiple is 0.454, which is the inverse of 2.2 um, for our linear color profile. Now, to actually get this render looking a lot better and having more of that indirect illumination result, there are some things that we can do in our render settings. Now, we could mess around and try to bump up the secondary diffuse bounces and try to get more bounce light into the scene. Um, but what I actually like to do is go ahead and add fill lights into the scene so that we're actually getting um, better final gather results because uh, when we actually have more light sources on our scene, it's gonna kinda clean up some of the noise that we were getting there in the beginning. So let's go ahead and take a look at the fill lights, see what those settings look like. And you can see this first area light is a fill that's inside of our scene and it's a sphere. So if we go down to the mental ray rollout, excuse me, the area light, the light shape is checked and we're using sphere. And I have my sample still very low. Um, and it does have ray trace shadows, and the color of it is um, very pale blue, kind of like the sky. And the intensity is very high because we have a decay rate of quadratic. Now, the quadratic fall off is an actual um, measurement that has been captured in, in real world data to describe how light falls off as it gets further away from an object. And um, this is going to give us a nice overall light inside um, that would be from the sky and we went ahead and took the emit specular off so we're not getting a specular highlight in our materials. This is just a fill. Um, think of it as a boost to our overall global illumination look. So the next light before we re-render, I'll show that to you, is pretty much the same only I've kind of got it more to a uh, sun tone um, kind of like a yellow orangish very pale though and it's pointing inside is an area light it's larger than the area of the outside of the window and it is also set to quadratic with a very high intensity the specular is not on and I'm using the light shape rectangle but is not visible in the render so what this light actually does is um, provides some more light this fill light to actually hit the back wall and it also illuminates our window sill so it looks like the light is pouring into the room um, and this light here actually kind of fills the area that is being bounced back onto the window so you kind of get this big bloom effect I want to go ahead and take our light here that's the pale blue and actually increase the saturation a little bit and then let's mess with some of our indirect illumination, our final gather settings. Now what I'd like to do is increase the point density back to where it was. We'll, we'll go ahead and hit one um, and then we'll take our interpolation and we'll put it back down to 20 and our accuracy to 100. So we're kind of, um, well actually let's go 200. So now we're firing way more rays into our scene. And so this is our result as compared to some of the darker uh, results that we were getting uh, without any of our fill lights. I would like to go back and tweak some of the I'm sorry, we'll go back to our outliner. I'd like to go back and tweak some of the fill um, light settings. So I would like to actually put this more blue. Okay, and um, so we, we don't get kind of this washed out color. I, I'd like to see a little bit more saturation. And I would also like to tweak the intensity of said light. So the inside fill light, which we can rename to that, we'll say inside fill. 
and then we'll call this one outside fill. I'd like to go ahead and lower the intensity. Um, let's say to 39. And then I would like to go into our sun direction and graph that in our hypershade and then go ahead and choose, um, I'm sorry, we'll go ahead and take a look at the, the MIA physical sun node and the shadow softness right now is set to one. Um, I would actually like to increase that, let's say to two and that will actually, and will raise the samples to 16, but um, doubling both of these numbers will get us softer shadows, and we'll also have more samples so our shadow will not look as grainy. And we'll go ahead and save this for comparison, and then render again. So that is a quick look at linear workflow in Maya, and I hope this actually makes your guys' renders appear a lot more realistic. Um, using all the properties of real world lights, uh, looking into how those are affecting your materials and shaders will actually go a long ways when using linear workflow. I didn't want to get into too much lighting uh, techniques and setups, but I wanted to show you how you could actually have your physical sun and sky lighting interiors and um, in the correct gamma space. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to comment below. Uh, if you have any recommendations for more tutorials, comment below. And thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you in the next one.